Welcome to the Brooklyn Museum. I am Sharon Ma Atkins, Director of Exhibitions and Strategic Initiatives. And I'm Drew Sawyer, the Philip Leonian and Edith Rosenbaum Leonian Curator of Photography. We are the co-curators for JR Chronicles, which we are thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be uh, opening to the public uh, tomorrow. Hopefully some of you have already um, had a sneak peek, but if not, with your ticket, you can see the show after the talk. Um, and we're so pleased to have JR here tonight in conversation with Baratunde Thurston, who is now re a returning guest to the museum. Um, so thank you both for being here tonight. So first, uh, a bit about JR and the exhibition. This is the first major exhibition of works by JR in the US, as well as the largest, um, the art, uh, his largest solo museum exhibition of his work to date. It features some of his most iconic projects from the past 15 years and premieres the Chronicles of New York City, a monumental mural of more than 1,000 New Yorkers um, that's accompanied by audio recordings of each person's story. JR defies easy categorization. Working at the intersections of photography, social engagement, and street art, he often collaborates with communities by taking individual portraits, reproducing them at a monumental scale, and repasting them uh, in nearby public places. His projects have brought together diverse groups of participants in cities across the globe uh, to share their stories and to inspire discussions around critical social issues from immigration to women's rights to gun, gun control. All of the projects that are on view here uh, honor the voices of everyday people and demonstrate JR's ongoing commitment to community, collaboration, and civic discourse. JR is a TED Prize winner, an Oscar nominee, and one of Time's 100 Most Influential People of 2018, all of which uh, made it feel like the right time to organize a major show of his work, and also because so much of uh, what he does connects to the Brooklyn Museum's focus on showcasing art that is uh, addressing the most pressing issues of our time. And Baratunde Thurston is an Emmy-nominated host who has worked for The Onion, produced for The Daily Show, and advised the Obama White House. Uh, he's the host of iHeartMedia's uh, podcast, Spit, wrote the New York Times bestseller, How to Be Black, and serves on the boards of Build and the book Brooklyn Public Library. Like JR, he promotes action with his unique blend of criticism, humor, and optimism. So before we leave this stage, we want to thank our generous supporters of the exhibition, Thank you to Clara Wu Tsai and the Ford Foundation, as well as the Brooklyn Museum's Contemporary Art Committee, the Fund, Stephanie and Tim and Gracia, and Periton. Additional support um, is provided by the Cultural Services of the French Embassy, uh, Emily Glasser and William Sussman, the Hayden Family Foundation, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, Pace Gallery, and the Robert Maplethorpe Foundation. Thank you to all of them. And with that, yeah, please join us in welcoming J.R. and Barry Tindale. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Check, check. Where's Brooklyn at? <laughs> and the other boroughs? <laughs> Thank you for double checking, because you know with the dark glasses, I thought there was only just the people in the front row. No, we got, where about Mezzanine at? Oh, even up there. Yes. I love the energy. I love it. Oh, it's the greatest city, New York. It's inspiring and uplifting and depressing and smelly and beautiful <laughs> and urine infused. It's an amazing place. Uh, can we just get a round of applause for this man right here for this biggest exhibition of his life? <laughs> biggest exhibition of his life! That, now, maybe there was nothing to show before. That's why, you know? That's why they couldn't do it sooner. Yeah, well, uh, they waited just the right amount of time, I think. And so I, I want to start with 10-year-old uh, JR. And at 10 years old, what did you want to do? Hmm. Uh, that's a good, you know, uh, at the time, I don't think I really had a plan. And I don't think I have a plan today. But I remember at 10 years old, wanted to, I had a lot of freedom, so that's the good thing of... of Where were of, you? 
paint a picture for us. Where'd you Out, live? Uh, so outside Paris in the project, so, you know, about 15 buildings looking at each other. In a neighborhood that's not too crazy, I have all their story, but I could play outside all the time. And so I was outside all the time, basically. And uh, uh, at that time, I just realized, well, you know, if I'm allowed to go every, anywhere, I can take the subway to see Paris, I can, I, I was curious. I, at 12, I found a job to work, because uh, uh, I had an addiction to candy. That's really what got me started. Okay, so you were a child. Well, which yeah. goes till today. <laughs> and so one day, the candy store that opened in my street, that I would go every day to, and I realized it was an addiction when, on days like that, when it was rainy, and if I was home and it was warm and I would want a candy, I would go out, take my bike and go there. That was like an addicted, you know, uh, first symptom. And so the guy told me, hey, I'm going to start doing market, street market. So I have to unload every Saturday on this place. And, and it's at 5 a.m. I'll give you candy if you help me unload when I can. <laughs> and I'll be like, sure, I'll be there at 5 a.m. So I would go there and I would, you know, open all the boxes of, the can of candies and I get his stuff ready so fast that by, you know, 5.30 it would be all ready. So the other people would say, hey, help me unload the truck. I'll give you a bit of money. And I started walking there and having a few people to, I would unload trucks for. And uh, so I could go to school on Saturday morning if there was school and come back after school to reload the trucks. And so that job I kept for six years uh, uh, straight until I was 18. And I think that gave me kind of a you know, uh, give me a lot of autonomy because I would make my own money, but also, you know, it would, it, it would just keep me busy, but it had nothing to do with what I was exploring at the same time, which was, you know, graffiti. What did you learn from these businesses you were working for? Uh, or about your community in terms of running in and out of all these shops? Obviously, you were doing it all for candy, so you were a junkie, <laughs> but besides, you know, your health challenge with candy, uh, what did you learn about your community or about these businesses? Well, you know, uh, what I liked going, uh, doing there, it was the fact that uh, I was unloading in moments before the markets opened. So it's almost if you're backstage. And in places like that, in the morning, you have all kinds of people that unload, people who come from all parts of life, people who are honest and people who are dishonest. I was really young and not really the strength to kind of unload those trucks but I was really dedicated and so the people were nice to me and were like, well, do this one after and I, was, I would have my little run. But some kids, you know, who, uh, who would try to, you know, uh, um, be mad, like, or uh, 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 be unnice with me, uh, I realized... I like that, be unnice <laughs> with me. That's what I'm going to use when somebody's being a dick. Yeah. You're being unnice exactly. right now. Exactly, <laughs> unnice with me. Our president and is very unnice. <laughs> it's the most generous way to talk about somebody. <laughs> And I, um, you know, I, I, would, uh, I would see that shit show before it starts. And that way I had to really, I, I didn't have my friends from my neighborhood. I was by myself in this whole other world. And yet it was just 15 minutes from my house. So it was, um, I've learned a lot from that. I was lucky that I had a pit bull at 14 years old. So I would take the dog all the time to the, when I was unloading. And that from that day, I never had a problem anymore. So that was, an, and the dog was so nice. He would not bite anyone. It just, you know, <laughs> so, so it was actually... <laughs> The best thing that yeah. happened to me. Yeah. But also, right after when it opened, sometime when I didn't have school, they would let me sell, you know. And the guy that I was unloading the cheese, well, he, I would learn a bit about the cheese. The people, I would unload the, um, the clothes. It was a guy who was like, yo, you don't care about the size, okay? When someone comes to you, you tell them it's their size. I was like, how, how do I do that? <laughs> They're like, it's very simple. It's like, and, it, and I'm talking about Grand Motors pullover. So like really, literally stuff that are really hard to sell. They were really expensive. My grandmother had one for years. They were really good, by the way. But what you do is you hold the, the, the pullover on the person. And even if it doesn't fit the shoulder, you, you pretend it does by touching the, the end of the shoulder. And you're like, oh, yeah, that fits right. Because the people can try it. So y'all didn't think y'all going to learn how to scam people in the first five <laughs> minutes, did you? That's great. Um, thank you for taking us backstage to the place you learned backstage of these shops. In the center of this exhibition, oh, it's your slide controller. You have a big mural that you and your team put together of New York City. You've lived in this city for almost a decade. 
So that's enough time to get to know the character of a place. What else did you learn about New York through this project involving hundreds of people from all five boroughs? Tell me about that. Well, I don't think I'm going to do bre you know, breaking news about what I've learned to New York that mm -hmm. no one here have realized. You know, uh, you know, the fact that it's an amazing melting pot, that people ask you where you're from before, how are you? The fact that it's all the adjectives that you use to introduce that talk. I, and it's also a city where you can go, like I, I, sometimes I was away for a long time and come back and you, it's like you didn't miss anything. You're just back on the train. Yes, stuff had changed, but the train never stopped. I mean, sometimes t the train does stop, though. Yeah, yeah. And like, it did. literally, it just stops <laughs> for, like, 10 minutes. <laughs> and maybe you lose a job, right? Like, very true. Well, I know you're, you're a very literal man, so I'll try to, <laughs> let me try to rephrase. I'm just saying, I'm going to do real-time fact-checking up here. <laughs> and um, the, the one thing that I really enjoy doing here, doing that mural, is that I think we all have that fantasy that when we look in the street and we see people from all paths of life, you want to tap on people's shoulder and be like, hey, who are you? Without having to do the whole, hello, where are you from? Like, just, who are you? Like, but we can't do that. That's not just nice. You can't do that to people. Let's say that the process of that walk allowed me and my team to do that, which means that we could literally point anyone in the street and say, let's grab that guy and find out who he is. And literally, 30 seconds later, if the person was also curious of, the giant trucks we had and the whole team, it looks like a film set. I was like, yeah, what do you want from me? And as soon as we get him inside the truck, I could be, hey man, I do, I'm doing this project. This is, you know, the, the back. It sounds like you're <laughs> describing like NYPD tactics right there. <laughs> like we just grab that guy and ask him what he is. And then, and then we, we put him picture. in the truck. Yeah. Right? I'm like, that's illegal, son. Yeah. <laughs> And then I would show the process to the people, yeah. and then I would say, who are you? And people would say, well, what do you mean, who I am? I mean, what is this question? I was like, no, it's just uh, to define you or to represent you in this mural, I need to know how you want to be represented. So let me help you by you telling me who you are. I was like, well, you know, I run the MTA, and I'm also a father, but I also run a little baseball team on the weekend. But I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa calm down. I, it's not a mural about your life. I need <laughs> one thing, how you want to be represented. And actually, people and say, you well, ask people essentially how they want to be yeah, represented. But I would want to hear all those before. Yeah. And, uh, and then they'll say, well, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm actually in my uniform now, but I don't want to be in the train or in the mural. Like, can I just be walking with other people? Can I just be listening to someone? Or can I just be in a conversation? Because they would see what other people have chosen. So the people would literally choose where and how they wanted to be in the mural. And that's how every single person have been, yeah. you know. So if someone said, well, I want to be interviewed, you know, by Baratunde, and you had come a few days before and did, I want to interview someone, but I don't know who. Well, that's possible because I would photograph you exactly like that in your very stylish pose and like, you know, <laughs> open shirt and your mic <laughs> listening. And then okay, I would find one now. guy like me who yeah. like with his five coats and his mic <laughs> who like be talking to you, you know. And then this would make yeah. sense, like we really talked. So, so can you rewind now for us? Because that gets us where we are, and that's in the center of the piece, which you all will see later if you haven't. Take us back to the suburbs of Paris, which are very different from suburbs in most U.S. cities. Take us to, I believe the region is Clichy, Montfermeil. Yeah. And you have your first mural project. First, do you have it in your slideshow? Yeah, we can find it. Let's, let's try to dig around for that. And the reason I'm asking is because you used these words, and you said, I asked people how they wanted to be represented which is so different from the way many people feel used by media, where someone is putting them in a story that they didn't choose, and you're letting people choose their own story, and it seems like it started way back here. Well, right before that image where I was 19 years old, I actually was just pasting small photos in the street. You'll see that. My first photo went since I was 16, 17, 18. I'm mainly graffiti, all right? Like I was tagging my name, and then I started photographing other people doing that. And, uh, and that's one little segment you see of those early photos. That photo, I have to say, really, it kind of happened to me. At uh, that time, I was not planning. I was, if you look well at that photo, actually, the proof is you can see on the back a repetition of the same image pasted on the wall. I was just pasting on the building the same image over and over. My friend that you see here, 
was filming me because he always had a camera in hand and was filming me that day like any other day. We would always do stuff together. At some point, some kid just come and say, hey, why don't you take us in photo? And I haven't even used my camera that day. I was like, oh, yeah. And my friend, I said, whoa, wait, take a photo of me. And as soon as he does that, all the kids come next to me. I shoot it. But then he's like, yo, get the fuck out. And I'm like, whoa, wait, no, stay, leave the kids there. But I couldn't look at the photo because it was filmed. I'm like, well, I think, well, let's try to do it again. Guys, do exactly what you were doing. And then I try to stage this image. And when you look at the film, it's all really bad. And so that day, that's it. I, I, we don't do much more. I go at the time on the Champs-Élysées. You could print photos in one hour. And I just did the negatives to a quick place for a couple of dollars. Yeah. And I mean, Euro or even Frank at the time, if you want to be, you know, I'm, I'm very careful with that there guy, guys, you know, so I'm help on me it. out. It's, it's going to be very precise. <laughs> so, and I call my friend and I say, yo, I think there's a photo that's like crazy. Like I'm, I'm making a photocopy of it now and I, I'm coming back. And as we were passing the photocopy, of the photo, everyone comes, they whoa, what's that, what's that? Oh, Lodge have a gun? And we're like, no, man, it's, it's, it's his camera. And another guy said, whoa, whoa, where was that? Like, it's just here. And we realized that all the people who grew up there knew us and knew him were keep getting confused by the photo where we just shot it there. We knew. So it was really weird. So we were like, oh, well, let's, let's do more photos. So the next day we call all our friends and we start hanging in the neighborhood, having guys jumping out of the building and for, taking photos. It was, it was a, for one day, we just had fun. Then we printed the photos bigger because we looked where, where can we do an exhibition where we don't have to ask anybody. And we just look at the buildings where it says, fuck the police everywhere. And we're like, let's just paste <laughs> over those buildings. So we actually, you know, printed it in strips. And you can see here on that photo, pasting the last strip. Well, th this is taken maybe at 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning because it, I didn't know how to do it, to be honest. And I was doing it with the, the, the pole here to clean the pool. So I put kind of a thing and, and a ladder, and it wouldn't even go to the top. And then on the second strip here, it was the wrong one. So one night we started, and then I always get like 100 guys behind me so the police couldn't interfere. So instead of hanging in the buildings, I said, come and hang down the ladder just for one night. And then I remember when we pasted the second strip, someone say, yo, it doesn't match. And I was so close to him. He's like, what do you mean? <laughs> yo, someone fucked this up. We're going to fuck that guy. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. What's, what's up? And then I was like, what's going on? Just tell me. I can't let the strip go. <laughs> and so I went down, and it really didn't match. And so they say, who's the fucking printer? I'm like, no, no, don't worry. I mean, I'll... so we had to stop. And then the next day, like, we print, then do all this and then do a few other buildings. And it's true, the police would come, but they would see all those people and would just be like, oh, let them be, you know? <laughs> what happened is that the mayor sued me for this, for pasting all the building. And he sued JR, which is pretty hard. If you go to the police station, it's like, I want to sue this guy called JR. It's like, we need a real name, you know? <laughs> so Never use your government name. <laughs> Lesson two. Yeah, so... Basically, I didn't get arrested. And at the time, I didn't have had a glass. So when the police would come in, they didn't know who was the JR. So um, they did bother my friend Lodge because they knew where he was living. And they were like, he was like, well, I well, don't know. He's the one holding the gun. <laughs> yeah, right. He took my photo. What happened there is that the city tried to clean it. But the people there say, if you touch this, we'll start a riot. So they never touched it. But I was kind of afraid at that time to pay for all the buildings I pasted on. And uh, I, I left at that time yeah. for a while. Yeah. The thing is, when I came back a year later. You left Paris or you left France? Yeah, France. Yeah. I left France. And it was, it was, you know, it was really the early beginning of street art. It was really like the first time people put the word on like. What the, year are we talking about? It, this was 2003, three, four. Okay. And so people were like, there was a small publisher who said, hey, man, you know, you see that movement happening online and you're doing your little thing. Why don't you email those people, you know better than me about this, and, and ask them photos, and you make a book, and I'll pay you for that. I was like, well, can you give me the money, and I'll go and photograph them myself. And that had actually allowed me to couch surf on, you know, on couches of, of people that were doing art, and also of traveling for very cheap, because it was the beginning also of like low-cost travel. So I was really lucky to be born in that generation that also would see digital arriving so it was also not a rich spot to do photography anymore. Yeah. When, I so I, when I came back to France, 
a year later, riots explode in front of that photo. The 2005 riots, I don't know if everyone to remember, were the largest riots we had in France since the French Revolution. That's when in CNN here, Fox News, you thought that Paris was burning and France was burning. Well, it, it started in front of that photo and then spread out to all neighborhoods because two kids were being chased by the police and they run in front of that photo and here was a, a electrical company building. They hide inside, but they got electrified and died. So the first car that burned was here and on the background you'd see this photo, but kind of crumpled because one year had passed on it. And suddenly it was all over the news. I was even on cover of New York Times paper as the background of the riots when I was like 20. So that moment is the moment where the neighborhood got on complete lockdown. No journalist could enter anymore. And because this was the epicenter, this was the most violent one and where it started. And so a lot of journalists couldn't get photos anymore. And I remember a big press agency contacting me. Couldn't get photos or wouldn't get photos? No, they, they couldn't because they couldn't enter the neighborhood. And the only way they could was with long lens. And I remember some of the kids coming to me with the long lens they stole from the photographer. <laughs> because they say, well, those guys think we're in a zoo. So which, you, it's like telephoto yeah, zoom exactly. lenses. Yeah, exactly. And so they were showing me that. But at that time, I had only that one camera that you'll see downstairs. So I was like, man, I don't know what to do with this. And plus, I knew nothing about photography. So I was like, what is this? You know, and also it's broken. So be careful <laughs> next time. So I, I had an email to my website who was registered in Canada on a porn site so that I couldn't get tracked. So it was bugging off. Lesson then, three. Yeah. Hide behind oh, yeah. Canadian That's the, porn. You know, that's the first lesson. You can't <laughs> link your website to your name. So I had a guy who was a hacker and who like linked it. So I could get the email, but yeah. the people could know where I was from. So I told the guy, the big press agency who wanted to speak to me. And at that time, it feels like important. So I was like, yeah, meet me in the neighborhood. The guy said, well, I can't enter. I was like, well, we'll get you in. So this guy come in like his open shirt and like, <laughs> you know, walk in. And so we talk and he looks at me and my friend and he say, okay, I have a job for you. Have you ever worked for the press? I'm like, no, I've never worked for nothing. So he's like, okay, um, you can take photos of your friends burning cars and stuff and uh, we'll pay you for that. Oh, no, well, I have my photos already, and I showed him my work, and this was like, oh, no, no, it's, it's great, kid, but I, I'm not interested in those photos. I want the photos of them burning cars. I was like, oh, but, you know, those are just a few kids who are burning everything. Like, most of them, they just go to work every day and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know, it's, just, it's not the question. So then, it's like, we'll pay you a lot of money for that. And so I remember talking with my friend, and at the time, we were like, well, what, it sounds weird, right? We're going to take photos of what's going on every night here? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't even know how to shoot at night anyway. So... <laughs> We went back to him and we said, no, man, we're not interested. He was like, all right, well, and we said, but if you want, our offer is still on. If you want to use the photo, there was a few photos from that. The year before, you can, and you can pay us for that. He looked at us like, yeah, right. He left, and then I was like, well, what should I do? Yeah. And that's where I started taking portraits, because I realized the only lens I had was a 28 millimeter, which forced me to be really close from the subject, which means that you know that I'm taking your photo. The complete opposite. That's why the project was called 28 millimeter. Can you pull up an example of that? Let's see if there is one. <laughs> oh, that's another photo actually from that, you know, that series. Uh, okay, so those photos were then pasted in Paris, and they were portraits of the youth from the neighborhood playing their own caricature. Because at the time, every day you open the media, people in hoodies, you know, hiding their their, their face burning stuff, so people were like, oh, maybe he's one of them, maybe he's one, who's who? Like, everybody was terrified about any use because they could have a hoodie and they could be burning things. So I was like, well, if you have nothing to reproach yourself, I'm gonna paste your actual face in Paris with your name, your age, and your building number on it. So you go from someone in the media you can't recognize to someone you can go and knock at his door. And I used that 28 millimeter lens and paste them in Paris, and I would also wait for the city to clean it because it was all illegal to go and grab photos. And uh, then years later, when they destroyed the neighborhood after the riots, I pasted them inside the buildings. And so at every floor, because we know how the buildings were made, yeah. and so the more they would eat the building, the more they would find those portraits. Clap if you didn't know most of that. <laughs> All right, we're doing our job. We're doing our job. I like real-time feedback. I don't, I don't want to waste New Yorkers' time. Um, <laughs> Your journey, I'm, I'm glad you took us back to where the portrait started, 
and it started in this particular community, and it started with trying to represent people who felt misrepresented or disrepresented, disrespected in the way that they showed up. But then you left your home country and you started working beyond it. And can you just take us to another place of meaning for you where you found stories of people wanting to see themselves and it either was totally something you didn't expect or it felt just like home even though it was the farthest thing from home? I was traveling that, that year that, or after? After. Okay. After. Yeah, because every travel, and you'll see that in the show, you have to imagine was kind of my first travel. So I was really naive and also discovering the world and so excited. So I would go in some place and I knew nothing about it. So I'd be like, yo, what's up here? Israel, Palestine, what's going on? Who is who? And I would really be like, you know, yo, tell me. And we were like, are you serious? You? No, I know a bit, but like, what is, well, those guys, they think we're fucking animals, these guys. And then I would go on the other side because with French passport or US passport, you can do that. And so you're, you're, the describing same a, you're talking about a project with Israelis and Palestinian peoples and you did it essentially a joint photo project with these two communities, yeah. though they didn't necessarily know how it was gonna show up. Exactly, but basically what I realized, on, I would consider this one my real first travel, yeah. you know, outside Europe, in, in another context. So you went straight to the heart of the most high conflict zones in the world. Yeah, like <laughs> because of a friend who might be here in the room called Marco, <laughs> and he was like, well, they're building a wall there, you should go. And I was like, well, you speak Arabic, you come with me. And then we went there, the thing is, uh, I think what really saved me there was being really naive and, uh, and the people being like, wait, wait, what are you trying to do? And I said, well, you're a hairdresser, so I want to photograph your hairdresser here in, in Israel and then I'm going to find a hairdresser there in Palestine and I'm going to paste you together. And the guy was like, yeah, right. I was like, why? Well, I let you take my photo, but no one on the other side will let you take their photo and paste them next to an Israeli guy. You will see, you don't know. And I was like, yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, you might be right, but look, I'm here. Can I take your photo? He's like, oh, you can take my photo. I'll sign even your waiver, but what are you going to do with it? I'm like, well, it's not really important, the photo. I'm going to paste it. And the guy's like, yeah, you want to paste it? What do you mean? Big like what? Like, you know, this table? No, like this screen. And he was like, oh, wow, okay. Well, let's see if you do that. And they would be really like, all right, I gave you my photo. Let's yeah. see if you do that. Yeah. Then we would go on the other side and then find a hairdresser. And we really, it was kind of a weird scouting, like you walk the street and you kind of look at through the window <laughs> and you're like, oh, this guy sounds good, like he have the mustache. And then the guy would like be cutting hair and he looks like, who is this guy? He's like looking at me. And then we were like, oh yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> we would go in and then the so guy would be like, hey, you know, people. can yeah, I understand. help you and stuff? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't speak, I, okay, you know, I just, um, uh, he's like, sit here, sit here, I'm busy. Oh, I sit here. Uh, look, uh, and then he would be, oh, what do you want? Where are you from? You look like a tourist. Yeah, I, I am actually. Oh, where are you from? France. Oh, great. And then I was like, so well, why are you here with this camera and this bag? No, I'm doing this art project. And oh, ah, it's, it's fun, you know. Do you know? And then they always like say Zidane. And I'm like, yeah, I know Zidane, <laughs> but whatever, you like know. Personally, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, I said, can I take your portraits? And he's like, oh, my portraits, why for? I'm like, well, I'm doing this project where, you know, you play your own caricature of how the other sees you. Oh, those guys there, well, they think we're all monsters. They think we're all, you know, bomb suicide bombers. And so I was like, yeah, no, no, I know, I know. But he's like, I'm a hairdresser. That's what I do every day. I'm trying to make a living and help my family. I, I know, I, I, uh, I want to take a portrait of you. And then I met another hairdresser who's exactly doing the same thing on the other side and just trying to feed his family. I, and the idea is to paste them next to each other. It's like, oh, do you think those guys would let you paste me next to them? You really think so? You're really naive. I was like, I know. I mean, I have to try. So yeah. would you? He's like, yeah, I'll take my photo. Who cares? Like, let me finish the haircut, but take my photo. <laughs> so we take the photo, make him sign the waiver, and then go on with, like, teachers, students, like, you name it, you know? Like, uh, um, oh, another one. Okay. And so... Um, you know, uh, there was uh, security guards, uh, people who work at gas station, yeah. activists, the three religions. Each of them accepted. And then we went back to France and we're like, okay, we have those photos. We cannot ask the permission from any side because if we get the permission of the Israeli government, then we look like we're taking a side. If we have the, the attention from the other side, which is not you know, the same organization or government with who, from who would have the authorization. And also, if we get sponsored by Coca-Cola or Meca-Cola, 
then we take side. So anything we do would make us take side. So we have to just go by ourselves, rent a car, and just paste the thing. So we printed everything, and the glue that I use is white powder. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't oh, find good. it everywhere. So <laughs> we poured it in a gym bag, a whole bag of glue. And because it took less space when you take it off from the box, I really went to the airport with a, glue, with a bag of full powder. of white powder. Great. Great. By the way, it made it easy to security. <laughs> and we filmed even the arrival. So if anyone's trying to sneak up drug, on, like, that's like the easiest way. Hey, 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 hey. hey. I don't know. Hey. I'm just saying. I don't do this stuff. I just want to <laughs> say this is satire. <laughs> and point out that any representations of criminal activity that you interpret are not what's intended from this stage. <laughs> So anyway, we get there with the glue, with the poster. We rent a van, and of course, there's like tons of stickers on it. We take them off, and we're so naive that we start from um, Hebron, which is, you know, technically on the Palestinian side, on the West Bank, but it's an Israeli town. I mean, it's very complicated. You're like, what is this? Who is that? It was very complicated, but we got there, and um, we started pasting, and we started encountering problem that exact day because it was a Jewish holidays called Purim where people make funny faces and we were pasting those faces there. So the first imam that stopped took it really badly and then it started to be a very deep conversation. You'll see some of those images in the show actually. There's videos you can see of how people reacted. But he saw that we were just a bunch of ignorant basically yeah. and he realized, oh my God, you guys really seriously? Wow, that's great, keep doing it. And then we go on to the next and to the next. And each time people say, well, we let you paste here. But they will never let you do that the other side. And again, remember, we would be in Ramallah in the West Bank, and we would paste like a giant face of an Israeli and then a giant face of a Palestinian doing the same job. Yet people will stop in the streets, look at us. And of course, first question always, you know, people never seen this kind of art. They're like, oh, what is this? Oh, it's you know, it's, I'm pasting photos with glue. Oh, okay. And then they're like, yeah, but who are those people? Oh, those are two taxi drivers. Oh, that's good. And you took those photos? Yeah, I took those photos. And another guy come. What are they doing? Yeah, he's taking photos of taxi drivers, pasting them. Oh, that's great. And then another guy shows up. Okay, great. Yeah, no, good. I mean, but uh, uh, who, who are those taxi drivers? And I was like, oh, yeah, one is Israeli, one is Palestinian. <laughs> <laughs> And then the my lead. friend Marco would always be there around and say, well, who is who? And he was like, well, you're asking me who is who? Of course I can recognize my own brother. That's the, that's the Palestinian. No, you got a wrong one here. But you get a better one on the next one. Here's two students on the book. Who is who? And then basically no one asked us to take down those portraits. No one would tear them down. They would stay. We could not believe it. Yes, there was real conversation. Yeah. And then we would go to the next city and the next city. And each time it started with a guy who said, because I would look at a wall and say, that wall is great. But of course, it's someone's wall. So we had to ask that person. And often it was like, well, what do you want my wall for? Well, we want to pass this. And what's the point of this? Well, who knows? It's an art project. We're trying to show that the similarities. Well, whatever. If it can help, just do it. So we're like, OK, that's easy. OK, we do it. The thing is, we would stay there maybe 30 minutes, an hour, paste it, then we would go. I met those people a year later. They told me that they had to talk about the project every single day. <laughs> because people would come to them and say, yo, Ahmed, what is this? Well, it's those French guys. What do you mean those French guys? What did they do? Well, it's a f and then every day, they hated me for that. <laughs> like you forced them, you recruited them into your whole team. And on the other side yeah. was the exact same thing. And right. I could not believe it. So to answer your question, my first travel was yeah. really to realize what it was to have that look to be able to go on each side where people only see each other yeah. through the media and they see often the worst of the others through the media. There are um, so many examples in this exhibit of you entering communities and being given access in a way that most people wouldn't even dare to ask or they would be rejected outright. And it seems like part of the reason you can get in is because you're pretty good at playing ignorant, even when you may no more. <laughs> And that's not like a subtext like this. I'm, you, will, you say things like, I'm just an artist. I'm not from around, like I'm French, I don't know. And so you can kind of, please. It's all true, by the way. <laughs> it's true, but you're, I, I just, I sense in a lot of these, in a lot of your work, 
that you're able to do the thing because you're not of the place. And yet, you're, you're trying to reflect the place. So how does such a consistent outsider get inside? Well, I think by the fact that they don't come saying, I know, you know, that really changed everything. So in most of those places, when I would go, the fact that I don't know made people say, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you about what we live in. Let me tell you about how it is to live here. And often when I started going further than there, like in Liberia or in, you know, Sudan or in places where I was like, all right, this is a place I've only seen through the media as like, through the war, or like I went there right after the war in Liberia, for example. I'm like, I don't think, I don't know much about art because I haven't been to art school, but I don't think art is what they need. Yet, I have a way to go there. I'm going to go and ask them if art would make sense. And I would go there where everyone say, what, those people might need other stuff than art, don't you think? What is the point of going there to paste photos on wall? I was like, I, maybe you're right. I, I, I would just want to go fact check it. And when I would go there and literally ask that to the people and kind of present the idea, I want to take a photo and paste it, and, but I'm not sure it's right. I was like, why are you not sure it's right? I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, I, is there another emergency that needs to be like, who are you to say what's the emergency? And don't you think we need dignity like other people? And then they made me realize actually the power of the art and how dignity came first. And I've had that answer in a lot of different countries. And I would go up all the way in the other side of the planet in the favelas and hear the exact same thing. I would go all the way up in other places. And in the show, you'll see that. But at some point, there'll be a big part of the show where I don't go to all those places. There's a part called Inside Out where you'll see an entire wall of screen. A round of applause. Who's familiar with the Inside Out project? <laughs> all right, that's most people. Great. And I said, I'm not going to go anywhere Whoever thinks this project should be in their neighborhood, send the photos, we'll print them for free and send them back. Well, I started seeing people all around the world pasting it in very complicated zones that I wouldn't even have the balls to go to, but also in places that are pretty rich and wealthy, and yet people feel they're being forgotten. I remember in a small village in Switzerland, a group of elderly people who did an inside out outside their retirement house because they say no one's looking at us anymore. And at the same time, there was people in Afghanistan trying to you know, fight for their right, pasting women in the street. So I think at, at some point, the, the, you know, or of course that journey, I realized that yes, being an outsider, but also sometimes not being there at all and letting the people like, do the work because I realized that when I was there, yes, the people would be more excited than me to install those giant work, but when I would come back, you will say, yeah, yeah, they were excited, but you did it. I'm like, no, no, actually, like, it's kind of amazing. The people got out their ladder. Actually, when we were pasting this, they found out the ladder from the Church of Nativity where Jesus was born, brought us the ladder in wood, and we pasted with that. Like, there was, I was like, are you serious? They're like, yeah, we went, it's okay, I know the priest is he's fine with it. You know, and all those crazy stories would happen. Yeah. And uh, we would go on the other side, and some guy would say, oh, you don't know how to do it, let me climb on it. And I would climb on those crazy roofs that I wouldn't even go into. And that would be the same anywhere, even in Liberia, where some rebels would start pasting on a broken bridge because the bridge was really broken in the water and it was slippery and they would see me fall constantly and they would laugh at me. And so they was like, ah, let us do it. Yeah. And they ended up pasting women that have been raped during the conflict, probably by some of those guys that were there because this was a zone that was not protected by the UN anymore. So you go in those really weird paradox. Those guys weren't applying to paste. They ended up pasting it. But by doing that, they were questioned, like, first they wanted me to pay, to paste there. And I was like, no, you don't understand. I'm not paying. And they were like, no, you're paying. And I was like, I'm not paying. I was like, why are you not paying? I'm like, because this is not advertising. I'm not renting the space. And, you know, I'm talking about rebels, like guys with machete. And they're like, what? What are you talking so about? You yeah. Is your strategy <laughs> to just annoy them into compliance? Yeah, it's a big, it's a big <laughs> strategy. Yeah, if you go over and over, at some point, they are, the head of the, 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 the guy would just be like, what's the fucking guy? And also, you look armless. I'm just with a bucket of glue and a, and a roll of paper. They want to take everything from me. Go ahead, do it. Like, I have nothing else. So they're really more curious. They're like, who pay you to do that? No, I came by myself. No, no, you, who pays you? I was like, I'm, I'm telling you. So they're like, what is this guy? What's the point of this? And I tell them, I'm pasting this. If you don't like it, you can scratch it down in front of me. You guys are 20, we just two. And at some point, I just, just paste it, you know, just whatever. Like, the, you know, we bought anyway. <laughs> so you are, you've done a, a good job, I think, of explaining 
how so much of this work isn't about your perspective and your point of view that you're imposing on these communities. So this work couldn't happen without the community. It also couldn't happen without a team. Yeah. And could you let this room in a bit more behind just what JR, the organization, is? Yeah. How many people, how do you all decide on a project and how many roles are there? And what do we not see? Get, take us backstage to the process. Yeah. Here. Well, it started on that project with the one guy who had wrote me uh, to that site that I had met at 12 o'clock at night, and he, he was studying at the School of the Louvre in, in Paris, and he was telling me, well, this work is part of the, the, the era of like photography mixing, juvenile mixing. He had all this theory about it. I was like, wow, you sound intelligent. You know, I've never even thought about it. So I said, well, you know, can't you, can you help me? And at that time, him and Marco, who I went with there, were like, well, let's try to see how to structureize this, but we had no structural order and no need for structure. Th then that guy became my first right hand. And over the years, each time some people would come and give a hand, you know, like Mark, who's in the room, who's my right hand here in, in New York and now over the, uh, all the studios, he, he just came and helped. Like he was just like after his walk and he was working in banking and stuff. And so I often say we saved him from that world. <laughs> and he, uh, he was helping. We take out him suit and I come and paste or cut strips. And then, then he was moved to Brazil. And when I would go there, I would always ask a place to not have to go to a hotel. So I would sleep on his couch. And then he would go to work. I would go to the favela. And then one day he was like, oh, can I go with you there? I was like, sure, come. And then, you know, at some point I said, well, why don't you work part time with me and take care of the school there that we were trying to build? And then uh, later on, when I came to the U.S. in 2011, he quit everything and started working here. So we built a team out of people who first came with just the joy of like, yeah, let me, you know, be part of this. I want to, our intern who's here, he actually d was doing Inside Out in France, his own Inside Out. And like pasting photos, organizing community, and then one day he wrote us and said, hey guys, can I just, you know, be there for a couple of months with you in the studio? And we were like, yeah, sure, come in, you know. And, uh, but we are a team of probably 20 20 and, people. Uh, yeah, 20 people, and, uh, you know, it's for sure understaffed, but we'd rather stay, I know it can sound like a big size, but for us, with the amount of project we do, it's small, but we'd rather stay like that. Everyone, you know, have a very intense part, and every single person is very important. Like, yeah. I, I literally can't do anything as a one-man man, so it's really a group. We, we function like that in everything, and, uh, and it kind of organize itself pretty well between Paris and New York. And so each time someone is at one place, the other team is prepping the next one. So I can just move from places to places and also have my French team there now right now in New York. And we had a project that just came up last week to go in a jail this Sunday. So we we're like, oh guys, you're not flying back. Let's stay, we're going this Sunday. We kind of improvise. Yeah. One of my you know, way of functioning is not having any meetings or, or you know, time of appointment or even accepting conferences, except this one when it's linked to a show, and so I know I'll have to be in New York, but I can't say that next July 12, I can say yes to speak at wherever, even the UN, I would never say yes, because maybe I could be walking somewhere else and I don't want to be canceling. So I have kind of a clear agenda where I can be, you know, working on projects that really move yeah. me and from the week to the next. And how do you, um, money? <laughs> So, no, it's a good because question. No, I wanted, and, and, so and, the people and won't be surprised when I go with my heart in the audience after. An extra it's great that you mentioned right? it. This is a fundraising night, guys. Lock the doors. Thank you all for being here. Block their cell phones, except for Venmo. Um, because you've made a point uh, repeatedly on the stage of saying, like, I'm not an advertiser. We're not sponsored by a brand. You've said before you don't work on commission. I'm sure there's a bunch of billionaires who would love their own JR project and could probably underwrite your work for the next 10 years, but you haven't done that. And you also don't seem to align with governments or other formal centers of power. So how do you money? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I used to say, like my dad owns Exxon, you know, or something like that. I would make that joke that, you know, my family was big in the oil money. But then people would really believe that. So I stopped making that joke. <laughs> it's a really bad joke. I stopped, you know. So, no, I, the way uh, I financed it from the beginning is through selling my artworks. So at the beginning, I didn't have a gallery. So I would go, someone would say, hey, I, you know, I really start, love, love what you do. Can I buy something? I would sell them a photo. and we would get a couple hundred bucks and we invested in it. So it was really easy 
And I really know the cost of what it is to make it, so I knew I could do it with nothing. And the more we scale on this project, for example, everyone paid their own flight, everyone was, you know, volunteer on it. And then over the years, then I could start hiring. Why? Because I did very little artworks of, over these years. So 99% of what I do is not for sale, it's just free to the public. But 1% is documenting those artworks. Mm. And I most of the time do addition of one at one size or like three at the same size, and those are owned by collectors who actually by supporting the work, by buying the work and by having it in their living room, probably they don't know it, but it pays for all the rest. Because as soon as we get the money, we're like, all right, let's do this project in the jail, let's do that project there. So yes, there's a few big people who own my work and they protect it. They make sure it goes in museum. Like this show here was also mainly made with artworks that are not mine anymore, that are people who own them and who say, yes, I would love this piece to go at the museum. And, and sometimes there is what I call shadow philanthropists, uh, which are people who not look to try to put their name on it to have communication about it, who are like, hey, I know you're trying to do something, you know, whatever in Paris and this and that. I want to throw some money in. I don't want my name to appear anywhere. I just believe in the purpose of it. And those people are very rare, but those people are having a tremendous impact because Sometimes they do help me, but they help a ton of other people. Yeah. And you don't hear about them as much as people who just shout their name out there or have foundation on their name all over. And yet they do an amazing work. So I'm lucky on my past to have met a couple of those people. Like, for example, I live in New York. I don't pay rent since nine years. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> you have everyone's undivided <laughs> attention. <laughs> this is the lesson they've been waiting for. Am I right? <laughs> Look, I'll tell you. And you don't like sleep on the subway, right? You have like a proper... No, no. Uh, you you know, we got AC home. at home. Yeah, it's yeah. Okay. okay, so... So the weird thing is when I won the TED Prize, which is normally when you go on stage and there's tons of people in the room and everyone is pretty powerful or have a lot of money or did some incredible stuff, you suppose when you win the prize, when the cameras are off, to be like, hey guys, who can help me for my vision? And people say, well, I'll help you, kiddo, you, what do you want? And then you raise money. But when it finished, I was like, guys, actually, I already sold artworks to pay for that project. I'm using the price money in it, so we have enough to start this project. And you can't really participate. I mean, you can, but it's the people's project. So if you want to participate and do a project in Pakistan, well, get people there to take the photos, send them, and we'll send them back. The people who would really participate are the people online who are watching this talk and who are gonna be, oh yeah, I wanna do this. There's one thing yet I have to ask. Who have a place where I can put the printer so I can send the posters? And a few people say, well, I'll give you 10,000 meters square in Brooklyn. And another guy say, well, I'll give you 5,000 meters square in the Bronx. And another, the Armory said, we give you a studio at the Armory. And I went and visited all those places and were amazing. But someone in the city uh, t told me, well, I have a place also and uh, you could maybe stay there for a year, and it's, like, it's almost like a condo building, but I'm not using it, and you, know, you could use it one year. So, I know, it sounds crazy, it's a true story. <laughs> when you say it out loud. I know. And I won't tell you El where Chapo? it is, but like, you know, it was, <laughs> and so we, we, you know, we went and visited that place, yeah. and it was crazy that by weird coincidence, I had pasted that building years before, like when I was 18, 19, and I left that neighborhood to come to New York. Anyway, and I told the guy, well, do you know the story? Of no, I don't know the story of this building because, you know, we just got it. It was sitting on the market. So I was like, wait, so what's the deal? It's like, no, just, you know, if you need a place to put a printer, you can. And there's places to sleep in the building. Just one year, that's it. Okay. So and what do I sign? <laughs> Signed it. Yeah. And then now it's been nine years. We don't pay rent, electricity, water. And we actually send posters around the world for free. And that helped us reduce in tremendously the cost. But also that person saw, well, look, if that's really what is your goal, so I hope you stay on the values you're defending. Yeah. So I can't be the guy who say, well, I got to do this shit because I got to pay the rent. I can't because I don't pay the rent. <laughs> so, you know, how often as an artist you're like, well, I'm here because I got paid, so I want to thanks, you know, LVMH and whatever. I want to thanks, you know. Uh, this yeah. brand, Nike, for supporting me, I don't have. I don't have to. And I don't have to sit with people who are not in, you know, uh, I, I don't have to sell shoes, basically, or anything. So, 
Um, that's really important, yeah. I, and I measure that chance that I have because it reminds me every day that if I decided to be an artist, even if I didn't know there was a job for being an artist and that there was even a museum where you could talk about what you're doing and doing shows like this, I had no idea when I started. So I should protect that at any cost. A moment. May we all live in such a way that we can find a shadow philanthropist to underwrite nine years rent-free in New York City. I want to ask you about the risks of participatory media. So many of your projects are open for seemingly, from my perspective at least, looking at Inside Out as one example, I want to do this art project. I want to put people's faces on the wall. But whose faces and in what context? And what is your team or your process for vetting the participants so you're not underwriting, you know, white supremacists or yeah. ISIS? I'm going to try to pull an image of Inside Out. Oh, my God, there's so many images in there. Well, this not, this not, this is cool. No, but not now. Not Kikito. Maybe later. We'll come no, back no, no, to Kikito. Later, later. Oh, a nice lunch. Hey, how are you? <laughs> All that right, no, I did want to ask you about that. Okay, this is Inside Out, so okay. it's always that size portraits, kind of all over the world, pasted by people. It was interesting because when when we say, okay, how do we build that project? And we always sit with all the team at the studio, and we're like, all right, how do we do this? If we're gonna let people do their project for whatever reason, and I remember I was talking with the people from TED, and we're like, well, we should select who are the heroes of today, and. We should, uh, you know, select the, some projects and then send them the posters. Right. And we're like, well, then it means that we decide who's good, who's not, what's worth fighting for, what's not. So I think we should, we should just leave it open, you know. And we just should put strict rules, strict rules, which is portraits. You cannot be uh, uh, sponsored by a brand or an NGO or anything. It has to be about your own ideas. You defend the color blue, great, we'll send you the poster. You want to fight for your right, we'll send you the posters. You don't like, you know, carpets, we'll still send you the posters. <laughs> it's, it is true, but it's true that also we thought, oh shit, maybe the, you know, extremists and right. some crazy parties and Nazi people would want to use that project and then we'll be printing for them. And we were like, well, we got to take the risk. So we took it and we started sending photos around the world and in tons of places. And the truth is, I don't think the Nazi people have heard about the project because <laughs> they never <laughs> send us the, the posters. That's one thing. And the second thing is that the main problem we had was people sending photos with their puppies. You know, that we had to be, <laughs> no, you can't have your dog in the picture. Yeah. That's, you know, yeah. it's not a family photo. So that's it. The rest was people really wanted to like, you know, share their ideas yeah. or replace all the photos uh, of Ben Ali, the dictator in Tunisia, by their own photos. You know, that was actually the first project in Tunisia. People saw that TED talk. It was a revolution in Tunisia. We started receiving hundreds of posters from Tunisia. We're like, what is going on there? Oh, yeah, revolution. And then we asked them, what's your idea? Well, no, we just, it's just the Tunisians. Okay, we send you the posters. And then they replaced all Ben Ali's photos by their portraits. And it was fascinating. And you'll see on that screen, uh, you know, there's tons of screen. Uh, there's two episodes of that because it was filmed at that time. Yeah. They actually encountered a lot of problem. I don't think we have the images there, but they, they were pasting posters exactly like that on the street. And each time they would paste and people would help them and stuff, there would always be one person who comes and say, what is this? You know, they'd be like, what do you mean? Was this, this is us. I took the photo, like the people who took it say, I took it, this woman took it. We all, a group of photographers, we pasting it. No, 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 no. What is this? They go, are you deaf, man? It's, it's us. You guys are trying to do a coup here. You're trying to get the country. And they're like, are you kidding me? No, we're not trying to get the country. No, no, no. Hey, guys, 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 this is, there's something wrong here. And they would start tearing down the photo. And trust me, this on the film, there was riots. I've never seen a riot started just with one woman questioning like that and turning everyone you know, upside down and then suddenly cars were flying and all this and they had to run away. Then they pasted it at night because I uh, advised them. I said, guys, okay, maybe <laughs> avoid daytime, do yeah. nighttime. Yeah. They would paste all night and then at 6 a.m. people would come very calmly. 
and just tear it down. And they were like crying, like, man, we, what is wrong with you? Which is, it's just us. Yeah. I, what are you hiding behind? And then an old man came and said, hey, 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 hey. You have the right, young girl, to paste your photo, okay? He has the right to take it down. This is called democracy, and it's the first time in our country that we're enjoying it. And he put the whole thing in perspective. They never had the choice of what was on their wall. There was one single photo of one guy for all those years. Suddenly, you can decide what's up or what's not there. Yeah. And it was amazing uh, uh, to see that, but at the same time, very moving, because I've, you know, I've never seen anything like that. And also, it was not my project. It was theirs. Speaking of not your project or mine, we have microphones here and here. We are going to open this up to some of you. If you can get to that microphone or that microphone, start lining up now. While people are doing that or thinking about doing it, I want to ask you, in the age of... Oh, there is people. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like one of the things you've done and, so, and your team have done is to let people control their image yeah. and control their voice, essentially their representation. But now everyone in this room and most people in the world have their own cameras and their own microphones and their own ability to distribute their images and voices. So how has that affected the nature of your work? Are you evolving in the face of people being able to do self-portraits and they don't have to send you a thing to print? And well, what, what is the... There is that, but that was with or without phone possible. The one way it impact tremendously yeah. is I'll, I'll tell you a story in a Three minutes, okay. fast forward, all and right? And then we'll go we'll backward. You're next. You ready? Okay. All right. So if you take a project, Time like now. don't look, close your eyes, close your eyes. Uh, okay. Everybody close your eyes, close your eyes. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's not a project, doesn't matter. All right. You see that wall? You know, I've heard about this wall on television and a guy, I forgot his name, talking about this wall every day. Yeah. Sorry, I'm French. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, and no one said you should paste on the wall because guess what? It's a see-through wall, so I can't paste on it. So anyway, I went there and realized that there was people living on the Mexican side close by the wall. And I just went and knocked at doors and realized there was a family living there. True story, the woman followed me on Instagram. I was like, no, I don't think so. And, you know, I get in the house, there's dogs everywhere, and a little kid in his crib, and the grandmother's there, and, like, five chickens running. And she's like, yeah, I follow you on Instagram. I'm like, I, I don't think so. Well, how weird would it be? So I asked her, Wi-Fi, we look. She did follow me, and she's like, you can have my house. So I <laughs> now you got a place in Mexico and New York. <laughs> so anyway, I said, well, I can't really paste your house. It's a bit too far, even if it's the closest. But thank you. Can I take a photo of your kid in the crib? Because he oversees the wall every day. So she's like, yeah, sure. You know, so I just take the photo. The kid is like that in his crib looking at me. And then I said, well, if I do anything, I'll contact you. Write me your email. And, you know, for now, it's my first time here. I'm just going to follow the wall. Anyway. Fast forward, in front of that house, actually, right down there, you see, behind, it looks like it's nobody's. And I've actually asked all the neighbors, I say, whose land is this? I don't know. Everybody just shoulder went, I don't know. So because I couldn't have a clear answer, I just went bulldozer style. <laughs> <laughs> so you just started bulldozing yeah. along the U.S.-Mexico border. Exactly. Cool, cool. <laughs> totally normal. Which, by the way, another trick, very easy. Anyone here can rent a bulldozer. They'll deliver it to whatever address. And it's a true story. That's what they do. And I just want to add that this is satire. <laughs> and if you no, interpret is any not. of this as a license to crime, no, that's no. on you. Well, who say this was crime? <laughs> it's not. They deliver it wherever you want. Trust me on this, OK? All right. So they deliver it there. And then we started digging because we had to level the ground. I was like, OK, if someone stopped me, fine. We'll say we're sorry. We'll put the. Send back where it was. It was there was nothing there. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. I'm French, I'm an artist, exactly. I didn't know. Well, yeah. weirdly, we did that for 20 days. No one said anything. <laughs> so then you go, next step, you say, can you build a scaffolding there? Same thing. It's rental, guys. You can build a scaffolding anywhere you want. <laughs> it's true. true. Look, let's do this. Try it on the Brooklyn Museum tomorrow. They'll show up at 5 a.m. And no one like from that. the staff will be there. The guys will start putting down the scaffolding, and then they'll come to work at 9 or 10. Maybe it's a museum or 11. Who knows? And then they'll be like, what is going on here? Well, clearly here no one said what is going on. So I kept on going until it was three times the size of the wall. And then very easily in one day, we actually pasted that little kid, which I asked the mother first. Yeah. And so 
pasted the little kid, went on the, uh, you know, on the other side. Uh, we, well, you know that photo where he looks over and there's the two gouts. It's another photo. Anyway, took the photo from the other side. And then what happened is I posted it. And to answer your question, I said to the people, anyone can come here and take photos. And that's one reflex we all have when we go some places or go see a monument is you go and you take your phone and you turn your back to the piece and you go take a selfie. I'm okay with that. And that's why I made sure you can even park your car there. So on the other side, there was a road and it was easy on either side. So people could come and go take photos on either side. Now what happened is that people started seeing each other through the wall because it's see-through. So they started taking photos of each other and even passing phones through the wall to each other. And that I have to say, because I was far away already at that time, I was like, someone's gonna get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, the weirdest thing ever, and I would watch that on social media every day, no one got arrested. I was like, no, 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 I was there for quite some days. I know there's a guard on every hill overlooking the border at every moment, and there's helicopters and cars passing there. There's no way. So those guys might be looking and say, let them be. But let them be for 30 days, because I rented the scaffolding for 30 days. <laughs> so this continued going on. You see the lines of cars and people and like, taking selfies. And on that side, they didn't have the wall, so they had this famous board <laughs> where people would use and like, take photo. This board became very famous, actually. And so, anyway, at some point, and you see, that's my process. It took me time until it hit my head. I was like, damn, we have to do something. You know how those museums, they do amazing opening and like closing with like dinners or, or we didn't do a dinner, by the way, that's, that's a good idea. <laughs> or like, uh, you know, having champagne or whatever. So I said, let's do a closing for that piece before it turned it down. And we actually did one mistake, is we try to ask for permission. One very bad mistake, because we send the drawing of a table going through the wall, and we send it to you know, the authorities, and we say, well, this has nothing to do with the other project. We want to do it at the fence. It's not us. It's just another idea. And they say, well, if you do that, we'll arrest everybody and deport the ones who are not legal, because you will be blocking our work we, actually, we are doing by the border. We learned that on the Friday, and we were planning it for the Sunday, even if we haven't announced anything. So we were like, let's go. So we went there, <laughs> and then oh, that's the photo I was looking for. So that's what you see from that side. And um, so we built a table on the Mexican side only. We built it, and then we paced the eye of a dreamer. She's from San Francisco. We invited everybody from the neighborhood, the parents of Kikito. We had a stand of tacos. We had a band there, and then we had actually nobody on the other side because we couldn't install a table. So we posted a new social media again to say, hey, whoever want to see the kid, last day, guys, come and see the kid. We're dismounting tonight, last day. And we were just praying. And trust me, at 11 a.m., you know, in the morning, there was nobody. 11.30, two people showed up in their car. Oh, we come to see the photo of the kid. We're like, whoa, whoa, wait, hey, hey, just can you come to the shadow on the wall and hold there for maybe not a minute, but an hour? I'm like, well, it's kind of hot and stuff, but can we take a selfie? Yeah, yeah, let's take a selfie, but just, can you just wait here? We, we're preparing a surprise, I can't tell you what it is. So they waited, then another car and another car, and each time we passed, no, hey, guys, guys, come here, wait here. Then at some point there was 20 people, and I was like, okay, guys, I'm gonna pass you a, 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 a tarp through the fence. Like a tarp, and then, yeah, like yeah, a, like a roll yeah. okay. And then you guys gonna all go around it and hold it. So we passed them the top, and they holded it. And then we sent a drone, and that's what you see. So they all sat, and then more people came. And then we sent the other half of the band that could enter the US, and they played the same music on each side. We would share the tacos, illegal tacos going to the U US side. <laughs> and then we stayed there for actually an hour and a half, and no one came and stopped us. I was like, damn. You know, I was so in a hurry to take yeah. that photo. But actually, we could stay there, and we really enjoyed that moment. And it was like there was no wall. Pass me the salt, and the salt will go from one side to the other. And, like, and at some point, a border patrol car arrived. One guy comes down, and I tell to the people, wait, wait, send him over me. I'm on the safe side anyway. I'm in Mexico. So <laughs> he comes. And then I, you know, I told him, well, at least would you have tea with us? And he, uh, he said yes. 
And that was filmed with a phone. And I asked the guy, do you allow me to post that video? Because we see your name on your badge. And I'm pretty sure you can be in trouble for even being here with us. And he said, yes, please do. You know, I don't care if I get repercussion because, uh, you know, I believe in the same thing. Even if that's my job, I st also have family on the other side. And he stayed there for, you know, another 20, 30 minutes. And then we packed up. And, you know, it was kind of those weird days where you're like, well, maybe the limits were not where we think they are. And where the use of social media yeah. and photos and stuff had actually helped that and right. created that project. Well done. Thank you. Whew. We are going to try to get to as many of you as possible. I would encourage brevity in the questions and in the answers just so we can get to as many as possible. Sorry, mon ami. sorry. So mon I'm ami. just trying to be, you know. <laughs> that was a great three-minute story. It took eight and a half minutes. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Well, and um, if you can share, if you're willing to, your name and oh. the region of the city you're in, but you don't have to. My name's Elise. I'm from, I live in Cobble Hill. All right. well, and your well. credit card number? We're taking every information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, this is going to seem now kind of insignificant, but um, I'm just curious, you have your point and shoot camera downstairs that you found in the metro and that's what you started to shoot with. So why and how did you start shooting manual photography on film and then digital? Well, it's a good question. I really didn't know how to. And uh, it's uh, a friend of a friend who, first I, I borrowed the camera of the grandfather of my girlfriend who was a really old camera that you know you kind of have to do this and point and think. That's how I did the photo of the guy with the camera. I didn't have a camera for years. And, uh, and I would use anything that I could borrow. Often that camera you saw in the subway, cause, uh, that I found in the subway, because it had that strong flash. But then I really was not good at you know, lighting or anything. And still I'm not good, because I've never learned it. But I really wanted to understand. So each time I could have 30 minutes from a photographer who knows well, I would say, well, explain me. How do you take photos when it's snow? How do you take photos when it's night? And, uh, you know, and I would go like that to uh, the process. But um, still today, I think I'm not really into one camera. I kind of use what's there. I don't really mind. And often I shoot with the phone or whatever. And even with a phone, I can blow it up that big. So I really am lucky that I was born in those years where photography just became, you know, such democratized. Thank you. Let's go over here. Hi, hello, my hello. name is Sasha. Um, I was wondering if there's a big project or something kind of on a global stage or even, you know, within U.S. politics where you kind of want to do a similar thing you did with the Israelis and Palestinians, or is there some really moving global cause where you feel like you need to put these two people side to side so that there can be a conversation? Yes, well, there is one that you'll see in the show that is uh, about gun control in the U.S., and I have to say that when I jumped in that issue, I knew nothing, like usual, but really nothing, because I couldn't understand, even living here nine years, how this is possible, how you can buy an AR-15, uh, you know, easier than you can, you know, get a drink at the local bar. So I didn't understand that. So when Time Magazine was like, well, would you do a cover for us? I was like, well, if I ever do something, I would, walk, I would love to work on that issue. And so what you'll see in that, um, uh, in that piece downstairs, it's, I've reunited around the table 250 people that really don't share the same ideas. People from the NRA to white supremacists to uh, Black Lives Matter, Black Gun Matter, to the mother of Mike Brown, to you know, a governor and uh, a mayor, like all of those people. And you can click on any of them and hear their story. And so it was amazing to me. To, I understand much better, actually, the complexity but I had to say that I found also some cracks in it uh, because what, what really happened is those people would never meet. They didn't meet in my studio also. I was like, but how can I trick those people so they would actually meet? So again, museums, opening, selfies, well, it's all a great mix. Once that was on the cover of time and they were all on the cover of time, I don't know if there's, is Mark, is the image in there? Yes, okay, so all right, it's a long journey, let's go. Not this one. Not this one also. Let's keep going. Well, that's the whole show, by the way. You don't need to go see the show now. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that was the, the image. And it's moving. Everyone, it's a video. 
the trick is that, yes, people were really proud. They didn't come for me. They didn't know me. They came because I, the pitch was like, you're going to be on the cover of Time. Trust me, with that pitch, you can get anybody. So we got, you know, people would say, well, I don't want to do this. Time is against this and that, but I'll still come and see, and maybe I'll do it. And then when Time couldn't convince them, I would say, well, send them over to me. And I'd be like, man, look, I don't know anything. I'm from France, so I'll take your photo. <laughs> you like it. We use it. You don't like it. You just don't sign and just go. Oh, okay, that's easy. I was like, yeah, I just I want you to be around that table. Do you want to be the angry guy? Or you want to be the nice guy? You want to be listening? No, no, I'll have stuff to say. Let me just, okay, just, I, I need just to conduct you a little bit. You need to look that way. And each time I would photograph some person, I, would, I need to really calculate the eye direction to kind of build this. Now, at the end of that, I was like, all right, cover came out. Everybody, you know, passed it on and stuff. But the real work starts when you get those people in the same room. And so the way we did it is very simple. We called places like the Brooklyn Museum all over the US. And we would say, hey guys, can we show this next week? And they were like, uh, are, you, are you dumb or are you just playing with us? You need at least two or three years. You know, since when we're planning this show? It was three years. So you need to plan this ahead. We cannot just show you next week. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. But do you have a room available? Well, we, we don't. There's exhibition now. We don't have a room available. OK, can I have the lobby? No, the <laughs> lobby is taken right now. There's an artwork. OK, can I have the parking lot? Yes, you can have the parking lot if you want. All right, I'll bring my projector, and I will say it's an opening at the Dallas Contemporary of whatever. Yeah, sure, we'll do it, you know, there. And we would do that in every city. What would happen is we would invite the people who are based in Dallas, who come from different backgrounds, literally, pro and against, and all kind of paths of life from the mural. And not only they were happy they were on the cover, but finally they could celebrate. So they would come to the, museum, stay to the museum, take the whole family, the grandmother, the kids, all dressed up, and up, and here we go, you're there. You put a few you know, bottles of champagne, it's an opening, everyone have a drink, and suddenly they turn their head, and here's a guy that they don't share at all the same vision. Now, what they could do before, talk to those people, because they were all in the same room, from the mayor to the NRA to, you know, the the uh, surgeon who like take the, the, the bullets of the body to the mother of Mike Brown, all those people were there. They would listen to each other's stories. And when they listen to each other's stories, they realize, oh, I see where that guy went through. Because those people, it was, not, it was not an interview. They would say, well, my son was killed by someone who was not supposed to have such a gun, who had mental issue and yet had access to that. So the person would be like, hey, I want you to know, I've heard your story, I'm you know, pro-gun, but I think there should be some changes because your son had died in terrible uh, circumstances and this should not happen. And then people would start talking. And it was amazing to see that happening in a lot of other cities. To the point that even the NRA magazine called me to do an interview and they said, thank you, we've never been so well represented. And at the same time, the mother of Magban or people, Black Lives Matter, also were really happy in the way they were represented. There was no debate on that. So that that piece is now actually in the museum of the NRA where, you know, as a permanent piece. And half of those people really don't share the idea of the NRA. So that's where, you know, I realized the power of murals. And, you know, I can't wait for you to discover the other ones. That was okay. short enough. Let's go <laughs> I'm scared of that guy. Come don't on. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just, you know, here we go. Hi. I actually don't have a question. I have a quick comment and some accolades. Is that allowed? Thank you. Well, okay. I, this way I can drink. That's cool. <laughs> um, it's about the piece Walking in New York. Um, it's, I think, in the very beginning, so you're going to have to go all the way back um, if you want to share it with the audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my name's Karen, and I'm an uh, art history professor at Brute College, which is one of the CUNY schools. And I teach right next to the schools right near Madison oh, Park. Okay. 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 And I teach uh, survey, as I'm required to, and I call them my reluctant learners because they don't want to be in that class. They just want to go to Baruch and get a degree in business and make more money than I do at my age now when they're 23. <laughs> so on the first day to let them know what this class is going to be and what art history means, I show them this piece. And it's, it represents so much of almost all of my students of 110 in my course, and it's a great in way into what art history is, what it does, and how them see themselves in the city. And I just want to say thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor. And congrats for the work you do. Yeah. Because you do the real work, you know, every day. So thank you. Let's go over to this microphone. Hello, hello. Hello. My name is Forrest, and I live in Brooklyn. I was curious to know, you have kind of a dual identity. Um, on the one hand, you're just the French guy who shows up 
and ask questions. On the other hand, you have been to the Oscars and you're kind of this icon with your hat and glasses. I was curious to know if, if these two identities ever interfere with each other or if there's a synergy with them or, or um, your life maybe a little beyond. I mean, you really disappear behind your art a lot. You have a distinct style, but it's, you always put the art before yourself, but you're also a person. Thank you for <laughs> finally seeing that. Oh my God, can we remember that the day? The moment he's been waiting for. No, it's, look, it's very simple. Most of the country I go to have never heard of me. So like before I take a big head, it would take, I would have to stop traveling and just stay in the same neighborhood. Then the second thing is when I take off my hat and glasses, no one also recognize me. So I can do that even like, I could be in this audience right now waiting for whoever to come and put another guy with hat and glasses and I could do the trick for a little. Well, the thing is, most of the time, because of that trick, I used to be completely covered. I have so much freedom. So that's why I keep doing it, even if for that show, I wouldn't really need it. But because for the border project, I really need it. You know, when you start renting bulldozer on a monthly base, you need that, you know, kind of protection to not pay fines the rest of your life. So <laughs> it's, you know, uh, it's, it's helping me. I didn't know that when I started, when I was 13, 14 but it definitely made more sense, especially in a day and age where now it's all facial recognition. I'm realizing more and more how lucky I was to actually completely not exist on the internet, except on the JR, and to kind of be semi-anonymous, because I'm not completely anonymous, it's not the idea. Now, I've been arrested in many places, so they know my ID, it's not like I'm hiding from the world, you know? They, in many places, if they pull up my records, they'll be like, oh, you're the guy who pays, and what are you doing here? But most of the time, because they see a guy dressed differently at the border with no hat and glasses, they don't, they just see me as a tourist. So they would have to pull those workers out to find out where I'm coming from. So it has saved me a lot, uh, a lot of time. Thank you. Over here. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is David. Uh, I was wondering, uh, what's, what's the next project? What's the next big thing you're, you're working up? Uh, thank you, David. Well, um, actually, so last week, a friend called me and said, hey man, do you want to walk in the jail? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I did once, but it was not really also authorized. It was at Rikers Island. So I, have, I pasted an entire building of the jail with no authorization, just with the warden who let me do it, but we could never advertise it. But you can still find the photo online. Um, and I said, wait, why? He said, no, 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 there's, the, the, you know, there's this subject, uh, uh, you know, that you should be working on, which is juvenile people under 18 who took life sentence without parole. And I was like, wow, that sounds heavy. I didn't know that was possible. He said, yeah, yeah, there's a few jails that walks on. I was like, look, right now I have tons of things I'm working on, so I don't really, I can't really, but, but first of all, like, how do I even get the authorization to, to photograph them or pay them? He said, well, let me figure out. There's one guy who claimed he said he's really connected over there, and he could, so I said. Where is so the place? He, Where is the prison? Uh, the, so that was before I even chose the prison. But he would say California. And then he, he told me, well, look, what would be the project? And I kind of saw my dream project, really like over like having breakfast. I said, yeah, man, I don't know what I would do. I would just pay the entire yarn. If you get me that, yes, I'll do it. Okay, hang up. Calls me later and say, okay, that guy had called the governor. The governor happened to be on your mural in San Francisco before he was governor. And the guy remembers being in the mural and how he loved it. So he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. If he wants to do any project in California, he have clearance of the 39 jails we have. So I was like, uh, it sounds a bit of bullshit, but I know the guy you're mentioning is really the governor right now. So I was like, okay, well, uh, when can I scout a jail? He said, well, you tell me. I was like, all right, well, find me a jail that the yard is in concrete and not in sand. So they started looking at aerial view. They found a jail tourist from LA. And they said, well, this one is concrete. So I was like, all right, can, can I send my team? Because I had the opening, you know, at here. And so I had to send someone in Los Angeles. So I called two friends. And I said, guys, I know it's going to sound crazy. Maybe it's all bullshit. But can you drive two hours out of Los Angeles to this maximum security for jail? <laughs> and those guys are going to welcome you. And apparently, you can take any photo you want. And I even ask for a drone shot. So they're like, are you sure? I'm like. I, I'm not sure, actually, but, you know, just, <laughs> <laughs> just go. So they went, and they had the craziest day of their life. They could walk on the roof. They could go in the mirror door. They met the inmates. They even tried to fly the drone, but actually it's a no-flight zone. So the guy's like, yeah, fly your drone, and the drone would not even, like, go up. So they went a bit outside, and, like, they were allowed to, they were, they were not allowed, but, like, managed to fly it. 
send me photos. And I kind of say, well, I'd love to do something in the yard. And then they were like, wait, they told me when you want. So I'm actually fine tomorrow, you know? And then I'm going there and gonna meet the inmates this weekend. And then probably we're trying to see a date, but it might be next week or the following week to paste it. So that's often, and this project you would have asked me two days ago, I couldn't even have mentioned. And now I'm mentioning it to you, it might never happen also. It's always, you know, it's always the case. It's like Kikito, the little kid at the border. You would have asked me that question and say, well, I'm going to try to go to the border and do a project there, but it's not sure. I could never confirm. So when I would say, well, you want to come to maybe the opening, maybe in my arrest? People are like, well, I mean, <laughs> if you're sure of the opening, I would come. But like, if you're not sure, I don't, you know, it's kind of a long way. So who knows? Like, you know, let's see if it happens. Thank you. Thanks, great. David. Great. Great. Let's keep it going. Hi, I'm Tess. Uh, my question is, how do you decide what project to take on? Well, I mean, it's a good question. Is, when is it just you? Uh, no, we discuss with the team. So if I come with a really shitty idea and they're like, well, you can do it alone, then I'm like, all right, maybe it's not a good idea. So actually, that's kind of often. So when, for example, we decided to do the GGL, everyone at the studio is already busy. Like Mark here is already, you can notice he's like his head is done already like that from <laughs> all the projects. But he was like, well, that sounds pretty cool. We should just go. And so that's why we're flying you know, tomorrow and we'll be there walking all over the weekend and, and as much as it takes. And that's why the team from Paris say, oh, we're staying here. We don't want to go home. Let's go to that jail and, you know, and see. So it often starts like that. And the project becomes bigger than us. And also it's issue that I don't know well. So I'm, as it goes, I'm discovering that issue. And we're like, oh, is the first idea the right one? Should it be only those guys, or should it be also the ones who made it out because there's a new law, or should it be even the families that have been impacted because of those same guys? What is the story here? We don't know yet. We're going there, and we're going to try to find out. So uh, it's interesting that often those projects can change dramatically from one day to the next because we, we're okay with the idea that maybe we had the wrong idea for a few days, and at some point we're just going to decide, okay, that's the idea. Then maybe it's not the right one, but at some point we just... Deciding. So often we go over crazy brainstorm and we let anyone who we meet on the way jump in the brainstorm. The guard, the, the head of the jail, that guy we connected to, another person who says, I was talking with Adam Pasternak about that subject just earlier when we were waiting upstairs. And she seemed to know much more than I know about the subject. So I was learning. On the way I learned about it. And yet, right after that, I might not know that much, but at least a little more. Hi, my name is Nancy. I'm a photography teacher in Rockland County, New York, which is on most days like 30 miles. Well, it's always 30 miles, but it, it was a couple hours to get here today. Wow, um, thank you for driving all the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was great. So, no, it was terrible. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Um, so, I have a little story followed maybe by a question if I'm brave yeah. enough. Um, so, the story is that 10 years ago, the school that I teach in um, participated in the Inside Out project. Um, my colleague, Shana, wave. My colleague, Shana, um, set it up. She's right in the center. Um, she set it up, and um, I mention her because she is currently working with your team to try and get the project happening again in our school. Okay. Um, so the story is that the first time we did the project with you, it was amazing. It was amazing um, taking these pictures of students and teachers and posting them all over the outside of our building created such an incredible sense of community within our school, but also, you know, within, within the community, there's this weird sense about teenagers that they're, they're kind of scary and up to no good, you know? And they're not, they're not, um, mostly. And so having their faces all over the building was amazing. The, um, the pictures stayed up for over a year. They just, I don't know, they just didn't come down. Um, and the funny, one of our funny stories was, you know, there was a couple of art teachers with five gallon buckets of wheat paste climbing on the roof of the building on our free periods, you know, putting a picture up and then running back to teach a class and then putting another picture up. And it was, it was awesome. So um, your team contacted us again in the spring to do the project again and like bring the photo truck and we were so excited, we're so excited. And I don't know what's up, but our district is throwing every roadblock in front of us that they can, like 
crazy things like, oh, the other high school in the district isn't doing it, so this isn't fair, or oh, the insurance, whatever it is, like yeah, whatever yeah. roadblocks, we can't figure out why. Um, listening to you and listening to how you just don't give up, just, like I thought you were going to say something very different. Just, <laughs> you're we one, all heard something very different. <laughs> You heard My mind different. auto completed the shit out of you that. You heard something different? <laughs> uh, no, I heard you don't give up. Maybe that's what I wanted to hear. But like you, you just gave us one last boost of energy to try to make this project come through. Um, so here's the question, and uh, you could totally say no. But I, I have my video camera ready. So does Shayna. Can can you just be like, hey, Clarkstown North? Yeah, yeah. Can just just do this, man. Just do <laughs> it. What's the problem? Maybe be a little more professional. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jay, I don't respect no rules. All right. An iPhone, man. An iPhone 10. <laughs> Sorry. I all right. Yo, Clarkston North. Clarkstown North, just do it. Yes, come on, yes. guys, inside Don't out. Don't ask permission. Super ask easy. Forgiveness. That's the truth. So guys, <laughs> seriously, whoever's blocking this, we don't give a shit. You can do it. There's no thing stopping us. You know what, even if the truck don't get there, the posters will. So they, we don't need trucks anymore. We'll send the posters anyway. So they'll end up being there, you know? Just tell them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. By the way, two things. The teachers do the most incredible job, and I'm serious. That's why I'm dedicating most of our time on um, doing, you know, books for school, doing books for kids, helping the teachers. That's why we reach out to school also, because we realize 40% of the Inside Out project are made by schools and are the most extraordinary projects. So you guys are doing the real work. That's why I love hearing the stories, because I don't get to hear them often. Our team don't get to hear them often, because when we send those posters, we don't oblige anybody to tell us what happened. So that's why we love receiving videos and stories, because it also keeps the team going, because they work really hard to get those posters over there. And so even if the truck don't make it there, who cares? You send us a photo, we print them, you paste them all over. The truck is fun, it's magic, but at the end, the posters will be up. So, you know, the project will happen. There's nothing stopping you. So can all the rich people stand up? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Elevate yourselves. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And congrats. That was, that was amazing. Hi, hello, my hello. name is Teresa, and um, I'm a photo retoucher, so I've been wondering what your Photoshop and post-production process was like. That's a good question. I mean, trust me, each time we want to start a project like this one, or project like, uh, you know, uh, let's see this one, for example, this one, mm -hmm. of course I would dream to do Photoshop so I could stay home. I don't have to <laughs> wake up every day, you know, and just make it look exactly like that without having to paste one single strip. But... This is not the way we do. So, unfortunately, there's not much Photoshop. The only time we used it is in the mural you'll see just to collage the people. Right. But if not, that's the, the really important part is every single strip was hand-pasted and by people actually who come to do it. And in this case, it was, you know, uh, 400 people who came every day to paste and, uh, and people we didn't know that we would actually let paste something that they've never done before. So, you know, it was, but the good thing about this is because we're doing it live, we can also see the mistakes live. So everybody's looking like, wrong one. You're like, oh shit, wrong one. <laughs> and so, you know, you always have some tourists around who are like, you guys are doing the wrong one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so it's, it's actually better just to be out in the outdoor and, you know, it's a much better studio. Mm -hmm. Great. We're kind of trying to get as many as we can. Let's keep going. Thank you. Um, I'm Brenda Brush. I'm the assistant principal at Julian Curtis School in Greenwich. And yes. um, we're here with my... Oh, hi, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Um, we have my art teacher, Leanne Hinkle, principal Trish McGuire, and our amazing photographer, Alexandra Korik, who's been working with us. Um, we are also doing the Inside Out Project. We are a tiny little elementary school that represents more than 60 countries and 30 languages. And our project is 
those kids and their individual photographs, and we're doing the pasting out on our fence for our United Nations Day Parade at the end of October. So we just got the pictures in. We're getting the stuff back. We're taking our day off on October 9th to be pasting on, yes. on boards. Um, but we're doing this as titled The Culture Within Us for our school and what we represent. So what would be your message to our 200 and some odd kids from those 60-something countries and their families? What would your message be to them about the importance of this Inside Out project? Well, you know, the, 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 the good thing in that question is I don't, I don't have a good answer. I'm <laughs> learning from them. They're the one giving me the message because by doing this project, it, they're showing me the way they all live together, they're all going to do that project together, why they're doing it. For me, the narrative that they're about to create is more interesting than mine. Mine is just like, yes, I want to hear from people I've never been to or I've never met in places I didn't even know about. But from there on, from each project I discover like that, where I see how many people are involved, and I'm always so impressed by how many people that are involved to pull up a project like that, that you guys have to like bring in and then to take the photos and then to like paste them. It's a whole, because we know we do it, but when we see other people doing it, we're like much more impressed because we do that every day. When you do that once a while like that, it's, you know, it's like, oh my God, what do we do with the posters? Which, you know, where do we do the glue? So I'm, you know, I'm very impressed by this. So I'm, I'm almost like speechless because what message could I have? I mean, you know, it's, it's really when I started the project, it was like, the idea that anyone in the world could express themselves and turn the world inside out with their own message. That's what people are doing, you know? And I don't want to add any message to that because that's just enough so that anybody can feel concerned about it and doing it. And when I see kids in school doing it, in elementary school, you know, I don't visit often those schools. And I remember years ago, I did. I said yes to one school and I thought it would just be a few posters on the, on the yard. And I was just there in Paris. I was like, sure, I'll come see the school. I went in. And they had worked on it for six months. They had passed the posters to each family, and each family would write in their own language, bring it back to the school, then the kid would pass it to another family, so they would look and discuss and what language is that and where this kid is from, and then bring it back. And they started involving the parents into it. And I realized, oh my God, just with 20 posters, those guys have made a six-month program. And I was really impressed. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you know I really have... Uh, no words for that except like thank you. Come see us, please. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Dina and I live in Williamsburg and I just wanted to ask you about your um, working you can choose with... To, you, can, you can still like change the answer <laughs> radically. I just wanted to ask you about the, how it was working with Agnes Varda on Faces Places. Yeah. You know, it's like I've, I've always been close to uh, elderly people. I grew up with my grandmothers. And so when I met her, I just thought I would meet this legend and that's it. You know, she invited me for, to have tea at her home and I went there. And then we clicked. And so we really started working together on a no project. We didn't have a project. When you meet someone one night and you like realize you want to meet again because we had never met before. And slowly uh, this relationship you know, grew and uh, we really like um, fell in love for each other and we forgot about the 50, 55 years age difference and I forgot, you know, uh, the fact she, she was not a grandmother to me, she was just another artist walking and we became friends and did those, those incredible journey and when someone else mentioned the Oscars earlier, it's not like I didn't do the, I didn't went to the Oscar by myself, I went with her, which means that I saw the Oscars in slow motion which means that I will remember every single image. Why? Because when you walk the red carpet with Agnes Varda, you go like this. <laughs> and so, you know how normally you're like, yes, yes, thank you, oh, hey, how are you? No, there you'll be like, all right, and then there's a TV who say, yo, we want to ask you a question, and we both look like, wow, that's a long journey, maybe not this guy. <laughs> and we're like, yo, we'll later, and then suddenly, you know, who are DiCaprio is passing, like, oh, shit, that was DiCaprio, and then, oh, Spielberg's over there all in slow motion. And then sometimes we're like, oh, let's take a break. And we're like, we'd sit, and like, they would still go on, and all those people, we'd check our phones, like, let's send a photo to that friend, and like, oh, hey, well, yeah, we're here at the Oscar, it's great. I, we had time, I really enjoyed it. And each time someone would go, oh my God, Agnes Varda, how are you? And she'd be like, 
who is this? I'm like, oh, my God, it's embarrassing. She's like the greatest filmmaker of all time. Anyway, so it was, you know, she gave me that amazing gift of actually living in this fast, fast life life and, um, and in slow motion and actually taking the time uh, to walk differently, to look at things differently. And uh, even if we were very active, uh, it was just another, uh, you know, another way of walking. So a couple of days ago was the, the, the premiere of the Irishman uh, Scorsese movie. And uh, I went there and there was all her photos over because the festival, the New York Film Festival is dedicated to her. And I know, even if she's always like, well, I don't like this Hollywood shit. I don't like this. Stuff. She had so much respect for Martin Scorsese and all the actors there that she would have been a little kid on that carpet. She would have gone and stayed on the side and look at all that, and, and I did that for her. And, and it was really like something, she had all those paradox about making independent movie and, and always feeling like you know, her film didn't get out enough because it's another kind of success. And, um, and at the same time, she had so much admiration for certain directors and uh, I, I, there, there was, I couldn't be there, but th there was uh, Scorsese went to Telluride, uh, which is another film festival mm -hmm. in Telluride, and, and he went there to speak about Agnes with her daughter and uh, her son. And at some point he said something that Agnes would often say. He said, well, Agnes told me that aging was like having butterflies living, out, uh, like, which represents her memories, living out of her bodies every day and see the, seeing them go. And he, as he said that, a butterfly came on stage and stayed there for like 30 minutes. So it's not like something someone saw. It stayed there and it would hang around. And then the daughter of Rosalie, of Agnes, her name is Rosalie, went to the stage manager after and he said, well, at this altitude, we don't have much butterfly. I've never seen one entering this space before. So I know she's there. I know the other day she was there. And, you know, she still have an eye on everything I do. And I can hear her little voice. She would always, you know... Um, like critics, anything I do, you know, like always, <laughs> you know, uh, even like now, she would be like, why is that? She would, uh, if I would speak to her, she would say, oh, you did that talk, that's great, but it, was it free? That's why the people came. Like, no, it was not. <laughs> like, oh, really? So who paid for them? How did they get their money? Like, she always had questions. Like, yes, it's not the point. It was a talk because of the show. Oh, okay, and is the show free? Yes, it is. Well, that's why people will come then. It's free. <laughs> so, she always had that voice. She was, you know, so I, I think she's still there. She's still present. And, uh, uh, you know, and she left that amazing, um, you know, legacy that people are discovering. And it's funny, since she passed away, a lot of people have realized, oh, my God, this woman, she did all this. We didn't know. So, you know, she's, she's present. Well, the gift that she gave to you is the gift that you gave back to us. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Paola. I'm from Mexico. Um, I have first a comment and then a um, question for you. First, I want to thank you for your projects and like the way you've given a lot of people in communities that do not have a voice, you've given them a place in the like global community and they're not like ignored or passed unnoticed anymore. So thank you for that. And then... <laughs> Sorry, I get nervous speaking in public. But um, then I wanted to ask you, now that you've worked with big corporations and big names like Time Magazine and the Rolling Stone Magazine, and even I saw you talk, took some pictures of Madonna, and would you like or have you thought about getting involved in using these influences in not only raising awareness for these people, but changing the realities that have to be changed for them? It's a, good, it's a good point. I mean, you know, uh, there's a few things that I realized. First, of course, when I was starting pasting those photos, I was like, all right, it's just maybe changing the perception, but how can you change actual things, you know? And can you, and is, is, even, is it the role of art? Who knows? Maybe not. Um, and then we've tried a few things, uh, and we're still trying. One is, uh, and you'll see it in the show, a couple years ago, I mean, 10 years exactly, um, we bought a, a, a house in Brazil when I was 24. And, uh, it's, and, we, and we started making a, a school there. But, you know, at 24, I didn't even know. I haven't been to school, so I didn't even know how to re uh, run a school. So that's the school. And it's in, you know, it's in Brazil on top of the favela. 
uh, it's still an arm favela, a no-go zone, and so we have classes every day, and now it's been running 10 years. And the truth is, you know, we have all those moments and all those people coming, and we even built a moon, you know, 36 feet above the house in the sky of Rio, completely illegally and bulletproof. <laughs> and inside, you can stand very on, and the teachers can sleep in, or the artists can sleep in, so they can come and give class to the kids. Since we have that, we had actually more teachers than ever. So that's the inside of the moon, by the way. So there is that, and you're like, wow, okay, from a small idea, something can you know, evolve, and it's possible. Um, and I'm starting my second school in the projects with my friend Ladge, you know, because a fun fact, the guy holding the camera like a weapon, he kept on making film, and he made his first film last year, fiction film, and he, it, he was presented in Cannes Film Festival this year, and he won. So he won prize of the jury, it's called Les Miserables. You're gonna hear about it, because it's nominated for Oscar already from France, it's the only movie they're pushing, and it, he suddenly like, became the biggest thing you know, in France and in the film industry. I keep hearing giant names mentioning his name, where before, you know, like I would have to say, oh, this is my friend. And now they're like, oh, so you know that guy, you know? It's amazing. And it's, so we're building our own school uh, starting January, film school and art school, where we don't teach actually students how to make art, but how to survive as an artist. How can you be a self-made artist once you, okay, you painting, you painting, you know, carpets like that. If that's your idea, great, we don't discuss it. Now, how are you going to actually show those carpets? How are you going to actually send PDF to galleries? How do you know even how to make a PDF? Do you know how to retouch your photos after? Do you know all the stuff we're showing how to... We, you, you're meeting people like Mark from my team who will tell you what it is to actually build a project. And you're meeting someone from a gallery who will tell you, well, if you send me a PDF like that, I would not even look at it. So that's our school, about very concrete, and we also taking all the students within our studio at different times of our projects. But also I wanted to try other things, things that are completely different from what we do. So of course we did the lunch at the border, but then when I met a chef called Massimo Bottura and I realized, well, with food also you can change you know, the, the perceptions of how we see each other. I was like, well, I'd love to try that. So in Paris, um, let's see, it might be further. Uh, in Paris, we actually, started a restaurant for homeless and refugee where every day we get the waste food. Let's see, or maybe it was before, no? Ah, it's right after, okay. And uh, no, it was before. <laughs> that was black screen. By the way, that was the mural of New York. Um, and we, every night we serve three course, like with Michelin star chef that comes and use all the waste food, the tomatoes and the you know, the, the banana that we wouldn't buy at the supermarket, we get those and they cook them in an amazing meal. So if I go back, I think I saw it. C'est après? You sure? After the black thing? I cannot say before you sure. Okay, okay. <laughs> this guy knows more clearly. Okay, I go back. So, and <laughs> it's been now one year and four months that we're running this. Every night we serve 100 people. And I have to say, I've learned so much from it because I thought I know the refugee crisis in Paris. I thought I know, you know, what was happening with the homeless. And until you meet those people in a place which is not condescending, where it's not like, here's some food I'm feeding you, but you're a waiter and you bring a three course meal to people by saying, do you have any food allergies? Uh, you know, here's the code check for you. Like you, everyone, every waiter have to play like if you were in mission style. So the people are guests and when they come in, uh, let's see if it's right after that. Tuck. Oh, oh yes, he was right. <laughs> right. Never doubt Mark. <laughs> Lesson six. So every night we cook and serve, and um, and it's always like in um, you know in in real plates, real glass, and it's the complete opposite of, of soup kitchen. And of course we cannot do giant numbers, but we realize the power of that. So we're trying to continue that in other places, like they're, they're trying to open now in Mexico, and I'm often helping on the outside, but this one we built from scratch and run it, and I have to say I've learned so much from it, even if it had nothing to do with my work, it's in the same philosophy of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Katya, I'm from Ukraine, but I live in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm curious, you had so many interesting kind of half collaborations and 
the full collaboration with Agnes, which was clearly very personal, more than just a collaboration. Do you, um, do you see, kind of like, do you dream of some collaboration that hasn't happened yet with someone who's like-minded or can really bring something new to your style of work? Well, I, I think all those collaborations really happen by accident, and uh, I'm always looking for, but they, they kind of come naturally. Uh, the one with Agnes, you know, I explained, really happened like that, and we were never talking about a film for six months, yet we were creating something, but we wouldn't want to call it a film. I love collaborating with artists, um, and uh, with large, my friend holding the camera, we, we, you know, we do the school, but we're also working on a documentary because we have been filming in that neighborhood and all our projects since 20 years. So we followed some of those kids over 20 years. So we have that and we always uh, you know, keep adding to it. Um, but I think working in collaboration is really what defines, you know, like the restaurant is with that chef, the school is with some great students and uh, um, professors, I mean, that I've, I've, I've worked with uh, over the years that we found and came. It's, it's kind of everything we do is in collaboration. And uh, so I never have a dream of with who, but when it makes sense, then, you know, I, I, then it happens. It's, it's, really, it's really like that. Thank you. Sorry, there's not like breaking news in there. <laughs> <laughs> the last one. Oh my God, better Hello. be good. The last one. <laughs> no pressure. Hi. Actually, I'm a lawyer. I was wondering if you need. I you you know, always need <laughs> a lawyer. <laughs> Trust me. No, my name is Claudia. I'm from Italy. Uh, I moved here about five years ago. I live in West Harlem. And I want to thank you for your work. I got to know you through my friend, Elenia. She works in an art gallery. And she said, like, you have to come. We, I came to many shows of yours. And now I have actually my, yeah, thank you. To <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want to talk. I said, go say something. You know him so well. But like, come okay, on. okay. Yeah, but I, I So have you send your, your friend. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I have your... Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, we always I'm need a lawyer. lawyer. Actually, I'd love to do human rights, so I'm working to do human rights, and I really love like your work that has such a social impact. Uh, when I saw them, I was it's amazing how art can be like so powerful. And I have your your uh, art like the migrants walk in my office. I carried this morning the frame on the train, super packed. I was kind of say I want it there. I'm migrant <laughs> myself, so I want it. And I want, to, I want to thank you and say maybe, um, have you thought about collaborating with like um, civil rights activists or pro bono lawyers? Because when I see your work, I think I, think I can, like myself, let's say myself, or like any organization with lawyers doing pro bono, like volunteering for migrants, for refugees, or like for the right of education, for kids, people who need help. Maybe, you know, uh, you can have an impact that is even more than awareness, mm. as like the, the girl before me was saying, like make a change. So if you, yeah. I mean, no, if you, you know, ever think about that. In, like in that school in Brazil, the first thing we had, because we had no teachers, is a group of lawyers exactly like that in Brazil came to us and say, well, guys, we know you opened that space. Can we come when you don't have school in the mornings or will you tell us the time and we have volunteers, lawyers, who want to help people in the favela fill their papers. And we're like, okay, that's not really the concept of the school, but why not? And actually they were the first one using the school on the first year or two. And that was amazing because a lot of the people from the favela who didn't know how to write or read would come and say, I have this problem with taxes, I have this problem with this, and help them. So whenever it makes sense, we do, you know, but I hope to create more projects like that so that it can embrace better you know, the, 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 the powerful tool that you have of knowing all those laws. Yeah, and you kind of, <laughs> yeah, that's, well, you, you kind of represent, you know, the idea when they say, oh, don't think about money, but have passion and create your ideas, money will come. Like, you represent that. And thank well, you thank, you. That. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, we're about to segue to the next part where you get to partake and have this lovely communal experience of this art we've been talking about. Margaret's gonna explain how that works. I just wanna say something to you, uh, cause I've been learning a lot from this process and from trying to prepare for it. And I, I thought I, I think I get what it is that you and your team do. And we, we're talking in this country right now a lot about what democracy is. Even the Finnish president is telling our president what democracy is. <laughs> and we have these really fancy words in America, right? That, that we try to have a government by of and for the people. And I think your work is all those things. 
right? It's by people. It's of people. It's for people. And it is providing that dignity and that sort of self-awareness, that collective self-awareness that we look for in so many other places, but you and your folks have helped us realize that it's inside of us as well. So I just want to thank you and that your, your art has a democratic practice, like, and it's very beautiful. And uh, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Means thank a lot. you. Thank you. Give it up for thank JR. You. Well, I, I wanted to ask my team to stand up, but now we won't <laughs> notice them. We're all so, on the you team. Know, there, I see two here, Marco and Mark, and I see Ariel here also, so let's give them a big round of applause. Yes. And there is uh, our intern, Luca, right there. He was doing Inside Out, and now he's with us. And maybe our future intern right here. <laughs> so thank you.